Okay, we'll begin with uh, electron geometry and Lewis dot structure. So what I want you to do is I want you to put pause, review all the molecular structures, review your Lewis dot structures, try to complete this exercise, and once you're done, press play and compare results. So for now, I'm just going to start drawing the chemicals. So boron trifluoride should look something like this. Boron does not obey the octet rule because it has six electrons in total, but that's okay because boron is one of the exceptions of the octet rule. The shape or the molecular shape is going to be trigonal planar because you have a triangle shape and it's going to be in the plane. So trigonal planar. And the angles are 120 degrees between each of the molecules. The next one, I'm going to do it in more detail. So it's going to be phosphorus trichloride. Phosphorus is in group 5A. That means you have five valence electrons. Now, when you fill in the four main electrons, you're going to start pairing electrons. So that means that phosphorus is going to have one lone pair. And then you're going to have three chlorines around the phosphorus. So I'm going to start drawing the chlorines over here. Chlorine, chlorine, chlorine. And chlorine has seven valence electrons, like so. All right, so now the last thing you have to do is join the dots. And there we go. Now for the shape or the molecular shape of this chemical, you're going to have a trigonal pyramidal orientation. So it's going to be trigonal pyramidal. And the angles between each other should be give or take 107 or 109 uh, degrees, depending on, on the molecule itself, right? 107.5. Now, next one is going to be xenon difluoride. Now, pro tip for the exam, I might give you the formula or I might just give you the name of the compound. Then you have to write the compound itself then the Lewis dot structure. So just be very careful with that one, okay? So this is going to be xenon difluoride. Xenon being a noble gas means it has all of its electrons already completed, so it already has the octet. And fluorine is going to be around this molecule. So what's going to happen is that xenon, since it is past group 3 of the periodic table, it can actually use d orbitals. Now, if you can use d orbitals, you can move electrons to the d orbital and create more bonds. So xenon does not have to obey the octet rule. So it's okay if we draw a couple of bonds over here. So what I did is I took one of these electrons, bonded one of these electrons and bonded. And last thing that I have is two, four, and I'm going to move these two over here. So we have the lone pairs, so it's going to have 2, 4, 6, 8, 10. 10 electrons, as I said, doesn't matter, doesn't have to obey the octet rule. 3 lone pairs of electrons, and if you go to the chart of molecular geometry, you'll see that this molecule is a linear structure. <clears throat> and the angles between them is going to be just 180, right? This is going to be slightly distorted because... You're going to have the, alone, uh, the lone pairs of electrons things there. So it's not going to be precisely 180, but you get the idea. As long as uh, you get the correct molecular shape, I'm going to count it right in the exam. The next one is going to be aluminum tetrachloride. And it's, it's, as you can see, you're going to have a negative charge on the aluminum. So let's go ahead and get started. Aluminum tetrachloride. Aluminum, one, two, three. And aluminum is in the same group as uh, boron, so you know that it actually has just three electrons. But in this particular scenario, we have a negative charge. That means that we have to include one more electron in the structure. So I'm going to include it here, one more electron in the structure, and then we have one more chlorine in the structure. There we go, aluminum trichloride. And what you can do is you can put a little parenthesis and a minus over here to denote that this is a negatively charged compound. Now, if you calculate the formal charge of aluminum, you'll see that it's going to be negative 1. Now, formal charge, remember that it's going to be uh, valence electrons, in this case 3, minus surrounding electrons, 1, 2, 3, 4, for the aluminum, 3 minus 4 minus 1. So there you go. 
All right, so this shape is going to be a tetrahedral and it's going to have angles of 109 degrees between each other. Okay, so next thing that we're going to do is uh, tellurium dihydrate. So once again, I'm going to skip a couple of steps and just show you the end product and how it looks. In this particular case, remember that tellurium is in the same group as oxygen. So you're going to have a lone pair of electrons lingering around over here. So if you have these lone pairs of electrons lingering around, what's going to happen is that the lone pairs are going to push the hydrogens down. So you're going to have the same orientation as a water molecule. If you remember, the water molecule is going to be a bend or angular shape. Whichever one you choose is going to be okay. And the angles between uh, themselves is going to be about 120 degrees uh, from each other. The next one is going to be uh, xenon uh, tetrafluoride. Xenon, as I said, I'm just going to skip a couple of steps over here. You should already know how to do this. So in this case, you're going to have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. You can have two lone pairs of electrons and four things bonded to this particular molecule. So if you go down the list, you'll see that this is a square pyramidal. All right. And the angles between each other are going to be uh, 180 and 90 degrees from each other. Oh, sorry. I said uh, pyramidal. So it should be planar. Square planar. And then there's one lone pair on the top, one lone pair on the bottom. Uh, last but not least, we have NH4. We already know that one because we have seen it many times in the lectures and we already seen it in class. So nitrogen is going to be a charged molecule. If you calculate the formal charge, it's going to be plus. And the orientation is going to be tetrahedral. All right. So hopefully you have the same answers and you were able to follow along. All right, so now we're going to move on to a slightly more difficult Lewis dot structures. We're going to quantify the pi bonds for more charge, and then we're going to move on. The first one, as I said, first put pause, try to make it on your own. Once you finish, compare the answers. Sulfur is going to be in the same group as oxygen, so it's going to have six electrons. One, two, three, four, five, six, two, four, six. There you go. Surrounded by three oxygens, and once again, Oxygen has six electrons, so it's going to have two electrons to make chemistry. I'm just going to put them over here. Now we're going to start joining bonds. One, two, three, four. So now that I completed all the free bonds or the, all the free electrons, I'm going to start using the lone pair electrons. One, and then I'm going to move this one on the bottom just for ease of my chemical structure. There we go. We got SO3 or the molecule SO3. Now to calculate the formal charge of each one of these oxygens in the sulfur. Remember, sulfur is going to have six valence electrons and is minus the surrounding electrons. In this case, one, two, three, four, five, six. Six minus six, zero. Same things for the oxygens. You're going to have two lone pairs of electrons over here. So one, two, three, four, five, six. Six minus six equals zero. So the overall charge of this molecule is going to be zero. Let's move on to the next one, NH2, negative. So we're going to put nitrogen, we're going to have five valence electrons. You have one negative group over here. So what you're going to do, you're going to put one hydrogen here, one hydrogen here. And that extra electron, we're going to include it over here. Calculate the formal charge of nitrogen. Nitrogen, five valence electrons, minus electrons surrounding it. One, two, three, four, five, six. Five minus six, minus one. Total charge of nitrogen, minus one. NO3, we're going to do the same thing. We already know the valence electrons of nitrogen, three oxygens. Oxygens have two valence electrons. Now once again I'm skipping <clears throat> putting the lone uh, pair of electrons on the molecules but you should include it in the exam. Uh, let me, yeah, let, you should include it in the exam. So uh, let's start joining the, the electrons over here. There we go. Now that I completed all my electrons I'm going to use the lone pair of electrons. One, one. Okay, perfect. And last but not least, I have one free electron in the oxygen. NO3 is given as a negatively charged molecule, so I'm going to have that one free electron on the oxygen. Time to calculate formal charge. 
nitrogen 5 minus surrounding electrons 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. 5 minus 5 equals to 0. Uh, valence or formal charge of this oxygen is going to be 6 valence minus uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So this uh, oxygen is going to have 7 electrons. It's going to have a negative charge of 1. Now, this, for the next two electrons, let's do the same thing. 6 minus surrounding electrons. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. 6 minus 6, 0. So the negative charge is going to be in this oxygen. All right. Let's move on with the next one. It's going to be I try iodine or iodine 3 negative. And what we're going to do is that we're just going to put the iodine molecule in the middle and two iodine molecules on the side. In this particular case, remember that iodine is a halogen, so it's going to have a total of seven valence electrons. If you want to draw all the electrons, we can start with one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I just arbitrarily put it in one place. It doesn't really matter if you start with the left or with the right. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, so right here I have a, uh, an extra electron lingering around. What I'm going to do is I'm going to put that extra electron from the negative charge in the middle of the iodine. So let's calculate the formal charge of the middle iodine. It's going to be iodine, valency of 7, surrounding electrons 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, negative charge of negative 1. Next thing is going to be oxygen difluoride. This is a very fancy compound, but it kind of looks like water. We're actually going to have two lone pairs over here pushing the fluorides down. And uh, that's it. All the, all the charges are going to be zero. Last but not least, tellurium. Uh, it should be capital T, tellurium tetrachloride. It's going to be a tetrahedral molecule. All the valencies are going to be zero. Now let's figure out the number of sigma and pi bonds. We already calculated the structure or the formal charge. Structure, now pi and sigma bonds. For the first one, you're going to have one, two, three, three sigma bonds and three pi bonds. Three double bonds and three single bonds. Good stuff. For the second one, we're just going to have two sigma bonds. Third one, we're going to have one, two, three, three sigma bonds, two pi bonds. Moving on to oh yeah, this one is going to have two sigma bonds, this one two sigma bonds, this one four sigma bonds. All right. Last but not least, dipole of each of the structures. So let's take a look if and see if the molecules have dipoles. So this one is going to have a dipole with each of the oxygens because oxygens are extremely electronegative. These two dipoles are going to cancel out each other because they're directly opposite to each other. But you're still going to have one dipole, so this molecule has a dipole. If it has a dipole, it's a polar molecule. Next one, you're going to have uh, the electrons pulling electron density, so this molecule is also going to be a little bit polar. Uh, in reality, it's going to be a very reactive molecule since it has a negative charge, but it doesn't matter. Let's go for the next one. Three dipoles is going to be the same scenario as SO3, so yes, it's going to be polar. Uh, next one is not going to be polar because the iodines are pulling electron density completely opposite to each other. So this molecule is not polar, it doesn't have a dipole. Uh, next one, you are going to have a dipole because the fluorines are a little bit uh, opposite to each other. So you are going to have a dipole in this molecule. Two dipoles towards the fluorine. Uh, since this is a bent molecule, remember, I'm reiterating this too much. So it's going to have a dipole. Last but not least, you're going to have four dipoles. And all of these dipoles are going to put directly opposite to each other. So this molecule has no dipole. And if a molecule has no dipole, it's non-polar. All right. So hopefully you got the same answers uh, to this particular exercise. And you were able to follow along. Okay, so for this one, we're going to look at dipoles. I went ahead and draw the structures before we started. So the first one is going to be this one. Remember that each chlorine is going to have a dipole moment towards itself. 
And what's going to happen is that since each of these are opposite to each other, they're all going to cancel out. So this molecule has no dipole moment. Next one is going to be iodine and three fluorines. These three fluorines are going to have a dipole moment in each direction. And then you're also going to have to account for the lone pairs. These two are going to cancel out, but you're still going to have a dipole within this structure. So this molecule has a dipole. And the last molecule, we have six fluorines. Each one of the fluorines is going to be directly opposite to each other. So in this case, all of the dipoles are going to cancel out, and this molecule is going to have no dipoles. Now, remember that before you begin, you have to draw or at least give the geometry, because with the geometry, you'll be able to figure out if this is directly opposite to each other or if there are a little bit more uh, distorted or a little bit more uh, angular in which case you're going to have a different dipole moment. <clears throat> so that's it. That's it. Okay, now let's review molecular orbital theory. In this one, I got a little bit ahead and did the drawings beforehand. Now, the first thing that you have to do is first look at the molecule that we have. In this case, it's going to be N2 negative. So that you know you're going to have an extra electron because of the negative charge. Second thing you have to do, you got to go to the periodic table and draw its electron configuration. So for nitrogen, you're going to have 1s2, 2s2, 2p, 3. Three electrons in the p orbital. So draw the electron configuration as such. And then what you're going to do is you're going to put one nitrogen in each side of the equation. First, you're going to uh, fill in the 1s orbital. So you're going to have 1s orbital and 1s orbital over here. Both of them are going to have two electrons. So you draw the two electrons for the s orbital, and then you're going to start filling in the bonding and the anti-bonding orbital. Same thing with the 2s. Since nitrogen already has 2s electrons, you're going to fill in the bonding and the anti-bonding. And last but not least, you're going to move on to the p orbital. In this case, I put 2p3. And then I just added the extra electron arbitrarily to, to this nitrogen. But it could, you can also add it to this one. It doesn't really matter. So it's going to be 2p3. And then we're going to start filling in uh, the bonding orbital. So it's going to be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. You have to fill in 7 spaces. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. There we go. We have completed everything. Now, the last thing you should do is calculate the bond order. So the bond order is going to be bonding electrons, so which is going to be 2, 4, 6, 8, 10. And the anti-bonding electrons is going to be 2, 4, 5. So it's going to be 10 minus 5 over 2 to give us a bond order of 2.5. So in reality, this molecule N and negative, the extra electron is what's creating the destruction of this uh, third triple bond that you usually see in N, N or in, in, in N2, sorry. So which one is going to be more stable? It's going to be this one because you can have a little bit more uh, bonding in the orbital. Okay, so for this next one, we're going to look at hybridization. I already went ahead and draw the molecules that we have on the PowerPoint. So remember that hybridization of a carbon atom is going to be based on the combination of atomic orbitals. So remember that in a p orbital, you're going to have three dumbbells, one in the x direction, one in the y, and one in the z. So what we're going to do when we have a double or a triple bond is that we're actually going to combine p orbitals to make a single uh, interaction or a single sharing of the electrons. So when we talk about the hybridization of the carbon atom, we have the option of sp, sp2, and sp3. In this particular scenario, we have for this carbon an sp hybridized carbon. The reason for this is that this triple bond actually mushed 
all these three p dumbbells or p orbitals into one single location so it looks like it's just uh, has an s and a p orbital that's why we say it's sp hybridized same thing with this carbon is going to be s p hybridized well actually i said it backwards s p hybridized right that's the only thing you have to do for these uh, particular type of problems so i'm going to uh, put a little arrow as to which carbon i want you to give me the hybridization so let's practice with this one so if I tell you what's the hybridization of this carbon, you're going to say it's going to be S, P, 2, 3. S, P, 3 hybridized because it's using three P orbitals to bond to one of these hydrogens. So each of these hydrogens and then the S orbital to bond with the carbon. All right. So it's going to be S, P, 3 hybridized. And then let's try to take a look at this one. Well, what hybridization is this carbon? So we're going to get started. S. P2. So in this case, you're using two P orbitals mushed together to create this double bond. So it's going to be like you have one S orbital and two P orbitals instead of having the SP3 all spread up with each element or with each atom. Uh, you can practice with this one SP23. So SP3. And you already see a pattern where the carbon has. Uh, bonding with uh, four different things it's gonna be sp3 when it's bonded to three different things sp2 and when it's just bonded to two things it's gonna be an sp hybridized now let's practice with this one because this one doesn't have hydrogens but it has carbons right doesn't matter which atom you have as long as you are using each of the orbitals to bond so it's gonna be s p 2 3 so this carbon is gonna be sp3 hybridized as well as every other carbon in this molecule. Okay, so the last thing that we're gonna see is bond enthalpy. So I drew a couple of things in advance to make it a little bit faster. The first thing that we need to know is that enthalpy, the easiest way to define it is just the energy of the bonds. Enthalpy is represented with a capital H and is usually accompanied by a delta. The delta means the change in. So we cannot measure bond enthalpy directly. We cannot just take a probe and say, oh, this bond has this much, this much energy. What we actually do is just measure the change in. And based on that, we are able to calculate values for the energy of the bonds. With that out of the way, the next thing that we're going to do is draw the chemical formula or draw the actual reaction. In this case, we have ethanol burning to produce CO2 plus water. When you burn a hydrocarbon, you're going to produce carbon dioxide and water. Once we have this formula, the next thing we have to do is balance it. So I already did that in advanced. Next thing, the way to calculate enthalpy is going to be the sum of all the bonds broken minus the sum of all the bonds formed. In general chemistry too, you're going to see the enthalpy is equal to reactants minus products. But for now, we'll just keep it like this. We'll keep it simple. The next thing that we have to do is, or at least for me, it helps me to draw the skeletal structure or the Lewis dot structure over here to quantify the number of bonds that I'm going to break and the number of bonds that I'm going to form. Now, this is up to you but what I like to do is I like to put two little tables on the bottom one that says bond broken one that says bond formed and the last thing that I like to do is just go step by step to make sure I don't make any mistakes now the first thing that we're going to do is that we're going to compare what happened over here and what happened over here so if you can see over here there's no more carbon hydrogen bonds in any side of this equation so what happened is that we broke all of the car carbon hydrogen bonds. If we broke all of the car carbon hydrogen bonds, we're going to break one, two, three, four, five. We broke five CH bonds. I'm just going to write it down here. And then over here, carbon is by itself. It's not bonded to another carbon, it's bonded to an oxygen. So we also broke this bond, which is the carbon 
carbon bond, and it's just one. And then we also broke this carbon oxygen bond because at the end of the day, we're going to have a double bonded to an oxygen, not single or double bonded to OH. So we also broke that one. I'm just going to write it down here, carbon oxygen. We broke that one, and it's just one. And then for the next step is we actually broke the oxygens so they can react with the molecule itself. So we broke this oxygen double bonded to an oxygen. I'm going to put it over here, oxygen double bonded to an oxygen. And as you can see, there's a coefficient of 3. So what we have to do is actually multiply this times 3 because you broke this bond 3 times. On the other side of the equation, we're going to have all the bonds that are formed. The first one that we're going to see is the carbon double bonded to an oxygen. And we have two of those. So we are going to have two. But remember, we also have a coefficient of two. Since we formed two and there are two CO2s, a total of four carbon double bonded to an oxygen bonds are going to be formed. Now, on the other side of the equation, Remember that we broke this bond, the carbon, hydro, carbon, oxygen, hydrogen. So we have one oxygen, hydrogen moving on to the other side of the equation. So we have oxygen, hydrogen. And to that one, we added one more hydrogen. So we added one more oxygen, hydrogen bond to make one water molecule. So we have one water molecule out of the way, and we still have to compensate for two more water molecules. So each water molecule has one oxygen-hydrogen bond, one oxygen-hydrogen bond from each side. So it's going to be two oxygen-hydrogen bonds for each one water molecule, and we have two water molecules remaining. So it's going to be a total of four oxygen-hydrogen bonds extras. So what we're going to do is four plus one is going to be a total of five. Okay, so now that we have all the bonds that are broken and all the bonds that are formed, including the stoichiometry of each one of the steps, the last thing that we're going to do is we're just going to actually do the calculation. So let me scroll the page a little bit. There we go. So it's going to be the sum of all the bonds broken minus the sum of all the bonds formed. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to now go to the table and look at the values for each one of these bond enthalpies. So in the book, it's going to be in appendix number two, or you can just go to chapter number nine and take a close look at the values. Now, the first value for this one, the carbon hydrogen, is going to be 413. A unit is going to be kilojoules per mole. Carbon carbon is going to be 348. I'm just going to skip the units for now. Carbon oxygen, 358. Oxygen, oxygen, 495. So I'm going to multiply 495 times 3, 358 times 1, 348 times 1, and 413 times 5. So I'm just going to start writing these. 5 times 413 plus 348 plus 358 plus 3 times 495. And this is going to be the bracket of the bonds formed minus the bracket of the bonds, uh, sorry, brackets of the bonds broken minus brackets of the bonds formed. Now the next one is going to be carbon oxygen uh, double bonded. It's going to have 799 kilojoules per mole. And oxygen hydrogen is going to be 463. Once again, these values you can get them from the book. So now I'm going to write it over here 4 times 799 plus 5 times 463. Close that bracket. And once we uh, multiply all of these equations and add them up, we're going to end up with, and you can just double check on the calculator to make sure. Uh, I'm going to make any mistakes. Oops, sorry. 42, 56, minus 55, 11. So this is going to be equal to negative 12, 55, 
kilojoules per mole. So this is going to be our final answer. And one more thing to note is that this particular equation is going to have a negative sign. If it has a negative sign, that means that energy was released in the form of heat. In this case, this reaction produced heat. And it actually makes sense, right? Because when you burn alcohol, you create a lot of heat. So just to reiterate, be very careful with the number of bonds that you break and the number of bonds that you form. It helped me personally to draw this equation in Lewis dot structures and just go one by one until I fill all my data and get to my final result. So it's not difficult, it's just a little bit lengthy and you have to be very careful.